Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault in London, a capital like so many in Europe, consumed without a response to the war in Ukraine. Tonight, Ukraine's emotional plea to Washington for more help. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. With more deadly attacks, Russia targeting civilians, Biden takes aim at Putin. I, I think he is a war criminal. Tougher talk, but American action is much more difficult. And Canada's Governor General weighs in on Ukraine. What would you like to see Canada do? I think we can do more. Perhaps take more people into our country. From refugees to reconciliation and meeting the Queen. An exclusive sit-down here in London with Governor General Mary Simon. I'm Ian Hanneman Singh. Also tonight, a big change for international travelers. I think it will make a huge difference. Let's do it tomorrow. CBC News has learned the government is scrapping COVID testing to enter Canada, but some restrictions are sticking around. This is The National. And this is London. There is real urgency to the Ukraine response here. 90,000 people willing to house Ukrainians in their homes here right now. The UK determined to break away from Russian oil and gas as fast as possible. The daily new horrors out of Ukraine consuming all corners here. There are signs of movement in negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Renewed talk of peace, but after three weeks, all we're seeing on the ground is the heartless destruction of war. Russia has captured none of Ukraine's largest cities. It's just blowing them apart piece by piece. This strike in a historic district of Kyiv, Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv, is being hit constantly. Among the wreckage, a school. No target seems off limits. This is a satellite photo of a theater in Mariupol Monday, used by civilians as a shelter. The word children written near it in Russian, clearly visible from the air. And today, it was destroyed. So what happened to that theater? Not the only sickening attack in Ukraine today. There are more scenes that we should warn you are difficult to watch. And as Chris Brown shows us, this isn't just threatening Ukraine's present, but its future too. In Chernihiv, people were reportedly queuing to buy bread. Accounts differ of whether they were hit by a Russian shell or machine gunned, but video of the aftermath shows lifeless bodies on the ground. For the Russian forces attacking Ukraine, killing large numbers of civilians is horrifically not uncommon. In Mariupol, where hundreds are already buried in mass graves, there may be a new atrocity. The city's main theater, which was serving as a bomb shelter, was hit by an enormous Russian bomb, says Ukraine's military. Hundreds were inside. It's not known the casualties. Amid such gruesomeness, it appears there has been progress towards a ceasefire. President Vladimir Zelensky said Ukraine wants a just peace with security guarantees. And Russia's foreign minister speculated that Ukrainian neutrality might be acceptable to Russia. But Ukraine wants all Russian troops out. Vladimir Putin is sounding uncompromising. He repeated his usual lie that Russia's military is not hitting civilian targets. With every new Russian attack comes an immense worry that the war cannot be allowed to destroy Ukraine's economy, especially farming. Fields are mined, roads are impassable. We visited the farm of Yaroslav Protselo, an egg and wheat farmer. Fuel for equipment is scarce, he said, diverted to military needs. So is animal feed and seed for crops. Ukraine exports vast amounts of wheat, corn, grains and sunflower products. And Andrei Zhidakchek, who heads an agricultural cooperative, expects those will be interrupted. Up to 50 percent of farmers will not be able to process their crops this year, he said. Ukrainian farmers towing captured Russian tanks have become heroic figures. But Ukraine's government is asking for more to get their crops in the ground this spring to avoid economic collapse. So, Chris, you mentioned negotiations towards a ceasefire. There's some talk of a peace plan or, I suppose, a peace process. 
How's that being received in Ukraine? Well, a Ukrainian presidential advisor is not calling it a plan. He's calling it more of a proposal from Russia. From the Ukrainian side, they're concerned that they don't see this delegation, the Russian delegation, as being especially high level. And their big worry is that uh, this could simply be a delaying tactic to perhaps get some kind of a ceasefire just to allow Russia to rearm and then keep attacking. Okay, so definitely skepticism. Is there any reason to draw hope from Russia's proposals? Uh, the small hope. I mean, simply by talking, the Kremlin may be acknowledging that it cannot achieve its primary goal of this invasion, which was to replace uh, the, the Zelensky government with one more favorable uh, to Russia. But some of the key problems, the key problem, I think, might be the territorial question. Uh, what to do about the territory that Russia holds? Could you see Ukraine perhaps recognizing Donbass and Crimea, which Russia held before the conflict? painfully maybe, but probably not anything that they've captured in the last uh, three weeks. So this puts Zelensky in a terrible position. Uh, how much longer does he dig in, does he fight and push for a better deal from Russia while every day Ukraine's cities are getting demolished from the air by Russian attacks? All right, thank you, Chris. That is Chris Brown in Lviv, Ukraine. According to Ukrainian officials, the mayor of Melitopol has been freed from captivity. Vladimir Zelensky greeted the mayor, saying Ukraine doesn't abandon its own. The mayor was kidnapped by Russian forces after they occupied the city. Interfax Ukraine reports that he was released in exchange for Russian prisoners of war. So, Ian, in the midst of all that today, Ukraine's leader once again turned his attention to other nations to ask for help. And today, Adrian, it was the United States, Vladimir Zelensky, making his case directly and passionately to Congress. And once again, like his speech to Canada, this one was tailor-made, calling on painful points in U.S. history to drive home Ukraine's request for Washington to do more. As Katie Simpson shows us, it left some in tears. And a warning, this story does contain graphic video. Volodymyr Zelensky has already won over hearts and minds inside this powerful room. But there is a limit to U.S. support, a limit he's desperately trying to push. Today, the Ukrainian people are defending not only Ukraine. We are fighting for the values of Europe and the world. He pleaded for more sanctions, more weapons, and his most important ask, for the U.S. to back a no-fly zone. Comparing Russia's invasion to pivotal moments in American history, the attack on Pearl Harbor and September 11th, he brought with him a video. An unflinching look at the horrors unfolding in Ukraine. Confronting lawmakers with the brutality his people face. Members of Congress were moved to tears as he made a last ditch appeal to close the sky. The President Biden, I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Republicans and Democrats stood united, but that limit Zelensky is trying to push, the U.S. position on his most important ask, remains unchanged. We are not going to enforce a no-fly zone in Ukraine. I do not support a NATO no-fly zone. We're going to give Ukraine the arms to fight and defend themselves through all the difficult days ahead. The president announced another $800 million in weapons for Ukraine, making it a billion dollars in support this week alone. And while he's toughening his language on Vladimir Putin, I think he is a war he's still not willing to budge. The worry is enforcing a no-fly zone could draw U.S. and NATO troops into direct conflict with Russia. So no matter how powerful Zelensky's pleas, he's not getting the full commitment he'd asked for. This will not be the moment he wanted. And Katie, what's left for Zelensky now with the United States still refusing to, to create a no-fly zone? He's been making the rounds, speaking to European Parliament, the UK, Canada. This was his most important pitch by far. And it seemed he knew he wasn't going to get that no-fly zone. So he said to at least give him the tools, more of them, to make it happen. 
NATO leaders will meet in Brussels next week. It's pretty typical for announcements to be linked to gatherings like this. Perhaps Zelensky can expect some kind of additional support coming out of that. For now, the Ukrainians remain on their own, armed with weapons from the U.S. and allies, but it's still fighting on its own. Ian. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Back here in the U.K. now, where Prime Minister Boris Johnson is trying to break his country's dependence on Russian oil and gas, but that won't be easy. One of the most likely suppliers has its own global baggage. David Cochran shows us the many misgivings as Boris Johnson turns to Saudi Arabia. Boris Johnson arrives in Saudi Arabia seeking to open a new front in the battle with Russia. His goal, to find harmony with the Saudis, to boost oil production and limit Russia's influence. Dependency that uh, the West in particular has built up on uh, Putin's hydrocarbons, uh, on Putin's oil and gas, we can see what a mistake that was, because he's been able to blackmail uh, the West, to hold Western economies to ransom. But while Johnson speaks of blackmail, others speak of murder. We really are going from the frying pan into the fire. Rodney Dixon is the lawyer for the fiancé of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was killed and dismembered by a Saudi death squad, ordered, says Western intelligence, by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Why would we want to run into the arms of a similar kind of regime and, and look to embrace um, people like the, the crown prince. He goes there because Saudi Arabia has the ability to help lower prices. But after the economic hit of a two-year and counting pandemic, it might not have the desire. It made no public pledge to boost production. I think you need to talk to the Saudis about that. But uh, I think there was, a, there was a, an understanding of the, of the, uh, the need to ensure stability in global oil markets and, uh, and gas markets and uh, the need to, involve, uh, to avoid damaging uh, uh, price spikes. Those price spikes are creating acute domestic pressure at a time of international conflict, most notably in Europe, which gets more than 40 percent of its gas and a third of its oil from Russia. And while their sanctions may have helped reduce the ruble to rubble, those energy purchases help finance Putin's war. David Cochran, CBC News, London. Now, the governor general is also here in London and has a lot to say about Ukraine and Canada's response. We sat down with Mary Simon here at Canada House earlier today. And so I'll be back a little later, Ian, with that exclusive conversation. All right, Adrian, we look forward to that. Here at home, CBC News has learned a major COVID rule is about to be lifted. By the end of the month, proof of a negative COVID test won't be required to enter Canada. The federal government is planning that announcement tomorrow, but Ashley Burke has the details tonight. As travel picks up and provinces open up, the government is easing up its testing requirements for travelers. We're going to continue to look at what more we can do. Some of that will be announced tomorrow. CBC News has learned travelers will no longer have to show proof of a negative COVID-19 test to enter Canada. Sources say that change comes into effect at the end of the month. I think it's good. I'm, I can't wait for all this to be over with. I had the PCR test and the rapid antigen test, actually both of them in Times Square in the back of a van. <laughs> so it wasn't a huge hassle, but the, the issue is that if you, if you test positive, you're stuck in that country. If they take it off as a requirement, I think that's a big risk because anybody could game the system. Dax Wilkinson wishes that change happened before March break. He runs an apparel shop hit hard by a drop in tourism and just got back from a ski trip with two friends to Montana. He called it an expensive and frustrating ordeal trying to find testing. Myself and my two friends are, are out, uh, you know, $300 US um, in total and um, that's a lot of money. The travel industry and some infectious disease specialists have long called for an end to the testing, saying it's ineffective. We're going to have variants that will come into Canada from the border, as will the rest of the world. Omicron is everywhere, BA2 is everywhere. Uh, and so again, we should be focusing locally on strengthening testing amongst people that need it. But sources say some arrival testing will stay. The government has $1 billion in contracts 
to randomly test people entering Canada to track variants. Sources say another measure is staying in place, the vaccine mandate for travelers. Anyone boarding a plane, train or cruise ship in Canada still must be fully vaccinated for now. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. There's more evidence tonight. Prices are going up for just about everything. Statistics Canada says the country's inflation rate is now 5.7%. That is a 30-year high. Jacqueline Hansen explains what's behind the rising costs and why it may still get worse. At this Calgary bakery, the cost of almost everything is rising, from flour to yeast, plastic bags and cardboard. You sometimes feel like you're treading water and you're just sort of waiting to see which, which, which wave is going to hit you next. The reasons for higher prices are getting more complicated. As we move away from COVID-induced inflation to a new inflation shock, which is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The region's supply of oil and commodities like wheat could get cut off by sanctions or by fighting, forcing global food and gasoline prices even higher. The inflation ahead of us in some ways is more nefarious than what we've seen behind us, particularly for low and middle income Canadians who spend a larger share of their income on food and gas. This bakery is certainly all already feeling it and so are some customers paying a couple bucks here and there more it adds up over time in the u.s where inflation hit nearly eight percent last month the federal reserve is taking action it raised its key interest rate for the first time in four years just as the bank of canada did earlier this month while higher rates may help slow consumers pent up demand for goods and perhaps rein in record high house prices, economists say it won't address the geopolitical uncertainty. So Canadians are not just going to be seeing some of their costs of everyday life rise across the board, they're also going to be facing higher interest rates that don't cure the underlying problem. This bakery increased prices in January and may have to again soon. Eventually the, there's a tipping point and at that tipping point you have no other choice to remain profitable and to be actually to survive. As more Canadians are also forced to choose which necessities are worth paying a premium for and which aren't. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. A by-election in Alberta has set the stage for a showdown with Premier Jason Kenney. His former rival, Brian Jean, won by a landslide last night. And a central theme of his campaign was to have Kenney removed as leader of Alberta's governing party, the UCP. As Julie Wong explains, the opportunity to do just that is coming very soon. Thanks very much. It's the return of a political nemesis for Jason Kenney. Brian Jean ran in a by-election on a platform to push Kenny out. Now he'll be a member of the caucus heading into Kenny's leadership review. The right thing is to resign while the party's together. The party needs to stay together and to unify, we need him to go. Jean is best known as the face of Fort McMurray during the 2016 wildfires. He was a leader of the former Wild Rose Party, but it merged with the former Progressive Conservatives to create the United Conservative Party. In a hotly contested race, Jean lost the leadership to Kenny. Please welcome Premier Kenny. Deeply unpopular, Kenny has faced criticism from both sides of the political spectrum for his handling of the pandemic. This government has not been perfect. We've made mistakes. We made mistakes through COVID. We emerge out of that difficult time with, with bright days that lie ahead. Let's seize that future. Your unpopularity makes it impossible for us to continue with you as leader. A grassroots organization is rallying conservatives to vote in the leadership review. I believe that if we do not uh, get rid of Jason Kenney, then Rachel Notley will be the next premier of Alberta. And I don't find that to be an acceptable outcome. I would say that there's a lot of momentum building here. Based on what we saw last night, looks like the edge of that momentum is, is on uh, Brian Jean's side and perhaps against Jason Kenney. In Kenney's own writing, there's a range of views. I listen to him and I watch him and... Uh... And uh, it re he always reminds me of Trump, which I don't like. I like Jason Kenney. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of bad publicity about him. I think he's doing a grand job. Kenney has less than four weeks to fight for his political future. His leadership review takes place April 9th. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. With skyrocketing gas prices, Canadians are looking to electric vehicles for relief. It's been absolutely mayhem. Yeah, people are coming left and right. 
Coming up, new government funding could mean more hybrid cars and more jobs. Plus, Canada's telecom regulator pulls the plug on Russia TV. If I were to say to you today that I don't agree with a certain political view, does that mean that channel needs to be shut down? The debate between propaganda and free speech. And here in London, the Governor General meets the Queen. It was a wonderful day. I think one of my best days since I became a human on this earth. In an exclusive interview, she tells me about the Queen's health and her concerns over Ukraine. We're back in two. Terrifying moments of this TV station in Japan as a powerful 7.3 magnitude earthquake hit the country overnight. It struck off the coast of Fukushima. Early reports of at least four people dead and dozens injured. The quake so strong it was felt as far as Tokyo about four hours south. Hundreds of thousands of homes were left in the dark. Authorities say new issues were detected at nuclear power plants around Fukushima. 11 years ago, a quake and tsunami caused a nuclear meltdown and devastated the region. Canada's broadcast regulator has banned the distribution of Russia Today. That's an international TV network funded by the Russian government that many call a propaganda tool. The federal agency ruled today that its content seems likely to expose Ukrainian people to hatred or contempt. Rafi Bujikanian has more on the ruling and who's speaking out against it. A source quoted in this Russia Today documentary calls Ukrainian soldiers tools of the U.S. government. Sent to the front line. Since late February, that state-sponsored Russian content has been harder to come by in Canada. Telecom networks removed RT from cable packages after Heritage Minister Pablo Rodriguez raised concerns about propaganda. We do need to counter the spread of harmful disinformation. The government also ordered a CRTC review of whether RT should be banned from distribution. Now the regulator says it should, saying RT's content tends to or is likely to expose the Ukrainian people to hatred or contempt on the basis of their race, national or ethnic origin. Russia today's presence in, in Canada has been a pressing is issue for the Ukrainian-Canadian community for a number of years. Hundreds from that community asked the CRTC for the ban. The more you can limit the access, then you take away the opportunity for that propaganda media to impact someone who currently may be in a neutral stance and persuading them to an extremist stance. Some suggest the government should go further, restrict access to all state-run channels. Remove authoritarian state-controlled broadcasters. They've been somewhat naive about the threats that Canada is facing. But there are also warnings against policing propaganda. If I were to say to you today that I don't agree with a certain political view of a political country, that may not be in war today, does that mean that channel needs to be shut down? Questions with no answers for now. The Heritage Minister indicated he's not a fan of any state propaganda network, but also would not say whether the government would ask the CRTC for reviews of other channels. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, let's go back to Adrian. You're in London where the Queen is expressing concerns about Ukraine. Indeed, Ian, Canada's Governor General is here meeting with the Queen who took a very keen interest in helping those displaced by the war. We need to look at how we uh, bring in uh, people from other countries. When you're with the Queen, uh, Coming up, my exclusive interview with the Governor General. Plus. Every single person in this apartment is definitely fighting a war. And in Ukraine, people are joining the fight armed with more than just guns. Welcome back to Canada House in London. After COVID kept so many people from traveling for so long, planes are increasingly back in the air, meetings increasingly in person, including a pretty big one for Canada's Governor General, Mary Simon, in this country. 
So the governor general met with the queen yesterday at Windsor Castle, that meeting catching the attention of many here as the queen had canceled a Commonwealth meeting just 24 hours earlier. She is still recovering from COVID. The governor general soon off to the Middle East to talk of refugees and Canada and Ukraine and how the world can do better. She sat down exclusively with the national right here at Canada House at the edge of Trafalgar Square. Yesterday, you know, you had your, your first meeting with the Queen as Governor General, and the rest of us will never get to experience that. What, what, what's it like? It was a wonderful day. I think one of my best days since I became a human on this earth. Uh, it, was, it was very heartwarming, and she was very welcoming. She was very sharp and uh, talked a lot about, you know, her own children and her grandchildren and also about the situation we're facing in Ukraine. That was at the top of her mind yesterday and is very worried about what's going to be happening to, to people in Ukraine. I would imagine she has a unique perspective on it, having, you know, having lived through the Second World War, hearing the air raid sirens, knowing what what it's like when a city gets bombed. Oh, she did mention that, yes. And, um, you know, during the years of um, the Hitler regime, I guess she was very much affected by, by that. And uh, she, I think she could almost see some similarities happening. And she, she t talked about that. You've both recovered from COVID. I mean, you, you seem in fantastic health. Do you end up sharing your COVID experiences? A little bit, yes. And uh, yeah, she's recovering, she said, quite nicely and, uh, and still has a way to go, but she's feeling good. Yeah, and I had COVID not too long ago, and thank goodness for vaccines, I didn't get too sick. She was very much aware of the fact that, uh, and I did talk about it, that people generally have had a, a bad experience through COVID. The mental illness in, in Canada has risen quite dramatically over the two, two and a half years. You know, the services aren't adequate, particularly for Indigenous people, but also for other Canadians. And uh, when we talked about uh, the, the war that's happening in Ukraine, people that are displaced and, and have nowhere to go, uh, do experience many levels of, of mental health issues, especially children, when you see the children that are with, either with parents or even on their own, that these people will, will require a lot of support. What would you like to see Canada do? Well, Canada has done a lot, um, and I think um, in, term, in terms of the humanitarian side, I think we can do more, uh, perhaps take more people into our country so that they can make it their home or when they want to go back, they can go back if that's possible. So that kind of thing requires a lot of, of work and uh, commitment by Canadians to welcome uh, people from Ukraine. Now, I'm not involved in the, on the side where they have to, you know, go through a process. But aside from that, I see a need. I see that we can do more. You know, you hear people talk about it's, it's difficult to come to Canada. I mean, you have to go through the websites or you have to get to the embassies and there's a lot of paperwork and how do they get from A to B. Would you like to see a, a more robust effort, Canadians at the borders, they're ready to help process people? Well, I don't really know how the process works, but I, I think, you know, you are right that the, the, that the system is, is quite difficult. I think we need to look at how we uh, bring in uh, people from other countries uh, and make it perhaps a little bit more simpler. I know that <clears throat> when we have to fill out forms from the Indigenous community, people always find it very difficult, even though it's within our own country, so I can't imagine what it's like for, for people to coming into the country. But, so when I cr do my cross-country work, uh, I hope to be able to connect with Ukrainian people across the country and talk to them about how they feel mm -hmm. and how they see the situation. 
when you were with the Queen, I understand you shared with her the, this Inuit concept of Ayuinata. Can you tell me w what that is and, and how she reacted to that? Yes, Ayuinata is a word in our language that is, that is an old word. The old uh, word Ayuinata means that if you're confronted with adversity or things that are difficult, you keep going, you don't give up, and you need to have, make a commitment to continue uh, to make changes. Mm -hmm. So there have been periods in, in, the, in the Inuit history that has been extremely difficult, and that word was often used as a way of either saying goodbye or as you're going out, you say, <laughs> you know, like that, and keep going. Uh, yeah, keep going. And that was important for you to share with the Queen? Be because I, I was talking to her about the, the various situations like uh, in Canada, the historical wrongs of the past and how we needed to change Canada's history books mm -hmm. so that young people could learn what the real history is without necessarily pointing fingers. And do you feel like the Queen is, an, is a partner in that, in this moment, that, that this that this matters to her at this point in her life? Uh, yes, it does matter, yes. She's very interested in what's going on in Canada. She talked about, you know, the truckers that came to Ottawa, and uh, she knows all, all of it. <laughs> Did that surprise her? She, uh, she didn't say she was surprised. I think she found uh, difficult to understand. And it's like the Ukraine crisis. It, she finds that difficult to understand. What's your sense of how engaged she is on, on the notion of, of reconciliation and, and the reality of, of the unmarked graves in Canada? In she is very aware. Um, and we talked about reconciliation. And I did talk about the need for healing in, in, in our country and to have a better understanding and a better relationship between Indigenous people and other Canadians. It's the next 10 days or so, uh, the delegations are going to Rome, um, Métis, Inuit and Indigenous, to, I, I think, begin in earnest this, this process of, of ensuring that the Pope listens um, to ultimately come to Canada and apologize. How much meaning do you put on that moment? I put a lot of meaning into it. The expectations are very high, and um, a lot of Indigenous people feel that this is something that the Catholic Church must do. And any time there is an interaction mm -hmm. that takes place between the Pope's office and Indigenous leaders, I see it as a positive thing because that connection has to be made, and there has to be a lot of work leading up to the time that the Pope will come to Canada and it's not clear what he plans to do in Canada at this point. So those discussions are very critical right now. So yes, she will be watching that Rome trip very closely. For now, though, the Governor General is off to the Middle East, to Qatar, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates, in part to thank them for their efforts in getting Afghans and Canadians out of Kabul a few months ago and to encourage more international cooperation on humanitarian issues. So meanwhile, in Ukraine, the fight that goes beyond the streets. In this time, all of us, we became warriors. The Ukrainian resistance that's showing up at every corner. Next. When you think Ukrainian resistance right now, these are the images that probably come to mind. Soldiers and civilians armed, trained, and on the streets, determined to push back Russia's invasion. But this is only part of the picture. There are other people, too, all over Ukraine, helping in all kinds of ways. And as Margaret Evans shows us, while they're out of the spotlight, they're still in the fight. Willpower, forged in the belly of a secret warehouse in the Ukrainian city of Ivano-Frankivsk one of the Western Ukrainian centers seeking to aid regions further east being systematically laid to waste by Russia. These men are turning peacetime skills to wartime resistance, building anti-tank obstacles, Czech hedgehogs as they're known. In this time, 
all of us, is we became warriors, uh, everything what, what we can do. Renata Nalisnik is part of an initiative uniting local authorities and civil society under the banner of Save Ukraine Now. They do everything from sourcing medicine and ammunition for soldiers to sheltering refugees. They know the drums of war are sounding ever closer, even here. In the one moment we realize that there is no safety anymore, anywhere. And in that time we realize that like, it's uh, the point that we can't back. Yeah. And we need to fight. Air raid sirens sound in the city often. So far, ivano Frankivs has been struck twice, its airport, both times. A reminder of the Kremlin's long reach. The city's residents are already hosting tens of thousands of displaced, some rubbing elbows here in the basement performance hall of the city's theater, doubling up as a bomb shelter. People doing their bit to keep others calm. The theater company was just about to stage a play for the benefit of the city's refugees. Artem Sokolsky fled Kyiv with his family. The sirens brought them down. Now he hopes the play will offer distraction for the children. They hear this, uh, you know, anxiety and they feel it all the time. So it's really hard for them. So for Mark's sake, we want to stay. The production is an adaptation of an old poem, one of the first literary works published in the modern Ukrainian language. With the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, denying there ever was a Ukraine, many here will tell you their fight must also be a cultural one. An apartment in another city, Chernivtsi, further south. Six people sharing two rooms, most fleeing the shelling of Kharkiv in the east. Every single person in this apartment is definitely fighting a war. And as we've talked before, it's just that, the, you know, it's, it's not a traditional warfare. We first met Roman Vidro in Kharkiv, just ahead of the invasion. He and other activists armed with hope that war could be averted. I remember talking to you before the war has started, and at that point, uh, no one actually expected that this is going to happen so soon. That doesn't mean they've given up, each taking to the internet in different ways to counter Russian propaganda. This is something you actually see right here in this apartment and that you could see in dozens and hundreds of other apartments at the moment where people are just doing whatever they can to fight back. Aliona Vorobyova, active in Kharkiv's cultural scene, is now trying to help the artists who remained by reminding the world of what they're living through. I ask them to film themselves for a few seconds, she says, because I know I can't ask them to film someone else in such circumstances, or to sing. Gleb Naumenko studied computer science at UBC. He says the group of friends has raised 158,000 US dollars for humanitarian aid. So much better to be doing something, they say, but the mask can sometimes slip. It's very depressing for me to think about this as like yearly projects. I, I'm, I'm still in denial and kind of hope this will end next, next week, I don't know. In another part of Chernitsi, there is a monument to the two city men who lost their lives in 2014 during the Maidan uprising that's come to symbolize Ukraine's turn to the West. Vasil Aksenin was one of the demonstrators shot by snipers in the center of Kyiv on February 20th. Aksenin's son, Bogdan, now a doctor, was 17 at the time. Today he's using his spare hours to help the war effort at his local church. He sees Russia's invasion as part and parcel of that earlier struggle. But it wasn't as simple, he says, as East versus West. He went on Maidan because it was not for Europe. It was uh, for uh, our freedom. 
and that, many will tell you, has become the glue holding the spirit of the Ukrainian people in place when faced with such overwhelming odds, in regions already taken or under fire, but also in the towns and cities mobilizing in the West to offer up every ounce of assistance and resistance. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Western Ukraine. And Ian, I can tell you that that impulse to do something is something we saw time and again in Ukraine. It's a combination of wanting to help your country and wanting really to distract your mind. And Adrian, the war is having a major impact around the world on oil prices. Governments here are hoping hybrid cars might be a solution. A multi-million dollar investment signaling a change in Canada's auto sector. That's next. Soaring gas prices may have you looking for an alternative to a gas-powered vehicle. So what about going electric or hybrid? Even if you can afford it, though, getting one may be a challenge. Nisha Patel has more on what the Canadian auto industry is doing to try to keep up. We are protecting thousands of high-quality, well-paying Canadian jobs. Honda Canada is upgrading its factory in Elliston, Ontario, as it revs up production of hybrid vehicles. It's a $1.4 billion plan, including millions in financial support from the province and the federal government. The auto sector is undergoing a major transformation, a transformation towards cleaner and greener vehicles. After news last week that two major battery materials plants are being built in Quebec, these are promising signs that Canada can still be a player in building electric vehicles. Usually several other smaller, uh, yet important and related investments will follow. Assembly plants are great at anchoring the entire supply chain. There are also growing calls to improve the infrastructure for electric cars like building more charging stations, which could encourage consumers to make the switch. Still record high gas prices have piqued consumer interest. A gas truck, say it's, what is it now, $200 or something to fill up, whereas if you charge at home overnight, we're talking five, six dollars to fully charge. Max Maurice sells used electric cars. He says the demand is so high and the supply is so low, it's leading to long waiting lists and he's paying sellers more than the original price for their used cars. It's been absolutely mayhem. Yeah, people are coming left and right. But at a Toronto gas station, Bevan Reith may be filling up his tank for the last time. He's awaiting delivery of a new electric car. Have one on order. Can't wait to get it. Reith says while it's nice to see the Ontario government providing incentives for business, he'd like to see the same for consumers. Follow Quebec and BC's lead with larger electric vehicle rebates. Let's feed both ends of the chain. Because more consumers shifting electric could mean a brighter outlook for Canada's auto industry. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. After the break, the Alberta artisan who realized there were few Indigenous dolls and decided to make them herself. Now these children have a doll that looks like them, is dressed like them, and, and they can relate to that. This representation moment is our moment. Next. Tracy Boucher is an artisan from Alexander Cree Nation. She makes ribbon skirts for her indigenous dolls and was shocked at the demand. She quickly had nearly 500 requests just before Christmas. That gives you a sense of the demand that's out there for children's toys that reflect the diversity of the kids who play with them. The story behind the dolls is our moment. My name is Tracy Boucher. I am a First Nations artisan from Alexander Cree Nation, and I'm the creator of the Indigenous Dress Dolls. We were invited to set up a little store outside of the Indigenous Peoples exhibit at Fort Edmonton Park. It quickly became known that we didn't have anything for the girls, so we had a bit of a brainstorming session. It was decided that we were going to do the ribbon skirts. The teachings for the ribbon skirts are um, the shape of the ribbon skirt is shaped like a teepee. So Women are traditionally the keepers of the teepee. I also um, decided to put the tops on the, the dolls, which is the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and the Every Child Matters. I am a first generation survivor of a residential school survivor. So that's near and dear to my heart. Those are, are issues that can't go away. They can never happen again. We have to keep awareness going. Kids need to know that. 
my daughters grew up with the blonde haired blue eyed Barbies as well. Now these children have a doll that looks like them, is dressed like them, and, and they can relate to that. So speaking of her daughters, one of them accidentally posted the dolls online and they sold 40 of them in 15 minutes, which gave her an indication that maybe there was a huge demand. They've had orders from as far away as Libya. That is the National for March 16th. Good night.